structure is very important for um your OSCE exam okay so don't forget your socrates or odipara your red flags um your maftosa dessa psychosocial right so these are your key parts of your history taken then if you need to examine or you need to interpret whatever it is you will be told that and your management okay so try to go over your management your management entails investigation and for your investigation think of your bedsides your bloods and your imaging okay so bedside bloods imaging and your management always involve your seniors okay so whatever you do definitely as an fy doctor your seniors have to be involved okay then we also went to psychiatry stations where we looked at how to the different type of cases psychosis bipolar um but we didn't do it in the soda but um it just follows is the same approach once you know the signs and symptoms to look out for you just have to practice it all right so today we'll talk about counseling station and for counseling it's more of being patient led being patient centered and just following the following the okay so for this um for counseling station is more of just really listening to your patient you don't really have to do a lot of thinking in a sense you don't have to remember oh did i ask yes sir did i ask this like you're just flowing you're just listening to your patient however a few key things that might help to you know make the conversation um nicer and very patient centered now for every station you need to introduce yourself okay so just like the other time hello i'm esther I'm one of the doctors in the department or hello i'm dr whoever i'm one of the doctors in the department whatever you want to say um again however you feel if you want to introduce yourself as doctor as your name your name and surname that's fine that works please i'd like to confirm a few details from you can you tell me your name and age okay so confirm the patient's name date of birth or the age whatever is given all right so then explain the reason so um i've been asked to talk to you today about something or i can see from my notes that you're yet to talk about so it depends on the prompts the prompts might say um patient is patient has appendicitis and is due for an appendectomy so go in and talk to the patient about the surgery so you can say that okay i can see from my notes here that um you add um an appendicitis and you're due for surgery so i'm here to talk to you about the surgery so you can always paraphrase so in counseling station you don't have to enter like how can i help you today right so our typical history taking psychiatry history we always we can go in like okay how can i be of help to you today but for counseling if you're giving a prompt try to use your prompt so you can paraphrase the information that is in the prompt okay so i can see from my notes that you want to learn about um this procedure maybe the patient wants to learn about colonoscopy so i can see from my notes that you want to learn about a colonoscopy right so just paraphrase don't just enter the room and say how can i help you i mean it's not wrong it's just it's just nicer rapport then establish good rapport with the patient so you ask them if it's okay to proceed again because this is counseling you're going to be doing lots of talking so let the patient know that you know if at any point you need me to clarify any information if there is anything that is not clear please do nudge me and let me know okay so open it up there for your patient let them be aware that you're willing to go over okay so if at any if, if you feel i'm going too fast or if you don't understand anything i'm saying please be aware you know and let me know okay so you always so you establish that rapport with your patient now another thing that you should do and this is the key thing is always chunking and checking does anybody know what chunking and checking is giving information in small pieces and checking understanding yes thank you right so you're giving the information in pieces and you're checking understanding so that's very very important so you cannot just go off like it's not a it's not a period for you to show off your knowledge yes they are going to assess your knowledge but even more than that is your communication skills 
So that means that you give your information in bits and pieces and then you chunk and check. So again, for example, you're doing a diabetic counseling. So you ask the patient, do you know what diabetes is? Okay, so diabetes is a condition in which there is increased blood um, glucose due to maybe the insulin, the cells that produce insulin being destroyed. Um, is that clear? Not diabetes is a condition where there is increased glucose because the insulin cells are not working well or your body is not responding to insulin. And so because of that, you can get complications like kidney problem, brain problem, eye problem. It's like, no, bro, you can't do that. Or no, system. <laughs> okay, so you can't do that. So you always have to chunk and check. You give your information in bits and pieces, okay? So it's really, really important. So you're yeah, assessing the patient's understanding and you're giving the patient opportunity to ask you questions because after you say anything, you want to ask them, is that clear? Is there anything you want me to, you know, clarify? And once you say, is that clear? Is that okay? If they have questions, they would ask you. And you must be willing to pause. Okay. You must be willing to let your patient lead you. I know, yes, it's a timed consultation. However, remember that the patients are not there to waste your time. So they will not tell you anything that is not in the prompt, okay? They will not waste your time. If they pause, it's because the pausing time has been factored in into the station. So don't be nervous that, oh my God, this person is taking time. Like it's been, it's been factored into it, okay? So don't forget to do that. So always chunk and check. Then eyes. I mean, in your history, like your regular chest pain, you may really find eyes weird. Like, why should I ask you? Have you given any thoughts about what's causing your chest pain? But in a counseling station, you need to ask your patient, okay? You need to find out what are their thoughts? What do they know about this condition? And the reason is because it really guides your consultation. Because if your patient already knows about the disease and they just want to know about the complication, then you will not be doing justice to the task. If all your patient cares about is complications, maybe that's what the that's what the height of the station is. Then so you need to ask your patient, okay? And for that again, I wrote it out what to do. So your first is what do you already know about your condition? Maybe you're counseling a patient with epilepsy. What do you know about epilepsy? What do you know about multiple sclerosis? And it helps you to know how in depth you should go in, okay? Concerns. What is your biggest concern or worry? So I can I know I, I see that you do have some idea about diabetes. So what is your biggest concern that you want me to help you out with today? What is your biggest concern that you want me to address today? What is the thing that you want me to really talk about today? Okay. So you have to do that in your counseling sessions, okay? In your counseling stations, you have to ask their concerns. Then finally, their expectations. Are there specific areas you want me to cover? For example, it might be that go and teach a patient how to use um, a spacer device. So the patient might just be more concerned about maybe how to take care of the spacer device. Of course, you will still talk about other things, but that also helps you so that you don't miss the important thing that the examiner is looking out for. You don't miss what is important for your patient, okay? So you might just go in there, you just want to talk about a spacer, how to use it, and you don't even remember to talk about how to care for it. But you know that once the patient told you, you know, no matter what you say, you must cover that, you know, that piece of information, okay? So don't forget to... Again, the main principles here are chunking and checking, icing your patients, okay? So chunk and check, ice your patients. Are there any specific concerns that you want me to answer? What are you hoping to get out of today's consultation, okay? So these are your ice Progress. your patients, okay? Again, I it helps you to be patient-centered, like I mentioned already, as opposed to going off course, okay? So you want to stay in line you want to make sure that you don't um you know go off course sometimes you might need to take a history but for those of you that have read dr sharishka book you would see that in some of the scenarios it says do not take a history so if the prompt says do not take a history then by all means skip it okay if it says you don't need to take a history then that's fine but some stations you might need to take a history okay so for example 
your patient with diabetes coming in for follow-up today. You might want to ask the patient, you know, how long have you been diagnosed with diabetes? What are the symptoms that you experience? And do you have any symptoms at the moment? You may want to find out if your patient has had complications of diabetes. Then even importantly, how, what, how is it being managed? Are they following a diet plan? Are they taking the medication? Do they understand how to take the medication? Okay. If it's a procedure, all right. So yeah, so you might need to take a history. So that's one. Another thing would be, it, it could be that it's a procedure. Okay. So again, remember counseling could be talk to a patient, patient wants to do appendectomy, or talk to a patient that is diabetic or teach a patient how to use an EpiPen, teach a patient how to use um, a spacer device. So if it's a surgery, then you want to ask, can you tell me why is this surgery? You know, why was this surgery planned? Okay. So again, you read your prompt, you ask the patient, I can see your idea for surgery. Can you tell me why? Then you probably want to find out if it's their first surgery. Because if it's their first then you might want to at least um, alleviate their concerns. And if they've had previous surgery, you want to know, is there, was there any complication? Were there things that could have been done better in the last surgery that you can address for this patient today? Okay. Yeah, so if they've experienced any complication from previous surgeries or previous procedures, okay? So these are things that you definitely want to know. Then again, by all means, if if you're told to take a history, then take your history. Okay, do your maftosa. You may be wondering why is it relevant? Well, if your patient is on any other medication and your patient is going for surgery, you need to know because there are some medications you need to stop maybe three days before surgery, five days before surgery, and night before surgery, or the morning of the surgery. So it's still relevant to ask about medication. Allergies, I mean, you must ask allergy. Because what if the patient is going to be allergic to the sedative that would be used? Do you get? So you have to ask all these things too. So don't see them as irrelevant. They are not irrelevant. But you have to ask them really fast, okay? This is not the time to... So are you being managed for any medical conditions? Any allergies? By chance, are you taking any medication, including over-the-counter, okay? So you have to be really fast. And that's why you have to have your maftosa. Like, you have to have all these things at your fingertips. You don't have time to be thinking, okay? So let it be second nature to you. Like when you ask, it just flows, okay? Then another one is, yeah, family history. Again, it will be relevant somehow. If they've had the condition, that would help you. Travel might not be necessary, okay? This is, you don't need to ask travel history, okay? So travel might not be necessary in a case of maybe a procedure or a patient is going for surgery. So as a doctor, as a clinician, you have to sift through what is important. So I just put this maftosa like, okay, that's what we usually use. But personally for me, if I'm to counsel a patient for surgery, I will not ask you um, um, travel. Yes, yeah, somebody said, can we do a complete history? It really depends. It really depends. In some cases, you might just do only maftosa. Okay, so I'm going to go for an example with you and then you would say, okay. Occupation, again, for each of occupation, just act psychosocial. So again, a patient coming for procedure, a patient um, having to do surgery, ask them, do you have any support at all? Do you have anybody that can help you out after the surgery? Sometimes it's a day case surgery, so they need somebody to take them home. So you need to find out, do you have anybody that could drive you home after the surgery? Who do you live with? Who can help you out? Maybe occupation to like, you might need one or two days off from work. Okay. But I will not spend so much time on those. Okay, but psychosocial is very important. Okay, psychosocial, like who do you live with? Who can support you at this time? Anybody at home to help you? These are important things. These are key things that you cannot miss. Then, of course, you can do your DESA. Okay, do you drink alcohol? Do you smoke? You may not ask diet and exercise unless maybe you're doing like post MI angioplasty, like or patient is going for MI angioplasty, of course. Like if you miss DESA, really, what are you doing there? Okay. So there are some stations that, again, you just have to sift through. My patient that is going for, colonos um, for colonoscopy, 
their diet doesn't really help me like what well, okay what exactly like how is it really it's not that relevant okay i'm not trying to actually if the, if the station says counsel the patient about colonoscopy okay then i don't i will not spend so much time asking you about do you are you on a diet do you exercise i mean if there is time by all means and to be honest for nca there is really time okay to be honest for nca you have 10 minutes so really and truly it only takes a few seconds to ask those questions okay all right so yes so these are certain examples that you might get for example a patient with asthma and wants information on space a device so we are going to use our spikes Okay, now some of you have only heard of spikes when it comes to breaking bad news, but you can also use spikes in a counseling station. Okay, so spikes, your S is your certain. Okay, so again, you will introduce yourself, you would make rapport, you will explain what you're there for. Hello, my name is Esther, I'm one of the doctors in the department. Can you please confirm your name and details? Um, you can also ask, is this a good place for us to talk again just kind of because you're giving information so you want it to be in a private setting but the assumption is obviously you're in a private setting for exam but you will not lose marks for asking that okay um i'm yet to talk to you about i understand that you want to learn about spacer devices and i'm yet to talk to you about it is that okay you should still gain their consent again okay um then p is perception so your s is your setting Okay, so certain involves introducing yourself, forming rapport with the patient. Okay, then your P is perception. What do you know about spacer devices? What would you like me to tell you about spacer devices? Are there any specific concerns you have? Or your initial P can be why are you using a spacer device? So are you asthmatic? Um, how long have you been asthmatic for? What do you take for the asthma? How often do you get attacked? Okay, then you could ask maybe triggers. So your P is perception. What does the patient know? You're getting information from your patient. Okay, then I is invitation. Okay, so now you want to tell them, so give them an opportunity. What would you like me to talk about? What is the most concerning thing for you? And you will see that this way you've done ice as well. You've actually iced your patients with your perception and invitation. Okay. So with your perception and invitation, what do you know about your condition? What do you know about specific device? Is there anything in particular you want me to talk to you about in space of device? You've done your expectations. Okay, what is your biggest worry when it comes to using spaces? Again, you've iced your patient. Then K is knowledge. So K is really when you begin to talk. But remember, we said we don't just go talk and talk and talk. We have to chunk and check. Okay, so we give the information in pieces and we wait for response. Okay, and trust me, there is more than enough time. When I say there is enough time, I mean, there is enough time, okay? You will most likely get a counseling station for sure. You know, you will get one procedure station, a prescription. You definitely get an history taken. It could be from any system, really, cardio, gastro, respiratory, musculoskeletal, neuro. Then you know that you will get a counseling station, okay? You're going to get a counseling station. You will get a psychiatry station as well. Okay, so definitely you're going to get all of these different um, stations. So in your perception, you've iced your patients, okay? Invitation, you provide the patient opportunity to ask you questions. Your K is your knowledge. So now you provide information about the spacer, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're going to be using patient-friendly language as much as you can try to break things down, Okay break it down as much as possible like to be in okay. okay so try to buy it as much as possible okay so don't um make sure you do that avoid medical jargons okay all right 
then again um yes so your e is empathy but empathy doesn't really work in this um counseling per se but you still use your spik okay however s is summary you have to summarize so you can ask the patient um are you able to tell me you know some of the things you've learned today you know, have you able to tell me, are you able to summarize to me what were the key and, um, you know, important details? And trust me, some of these patients will give you wrong information. Why? Because they want the opportunity. First, they want to test your active listening. Okay? They want to test your listening. So when you ask the patient to summarize to you, you should not be dreaming about, oh, I have to provide leaflets. I have to give. No, no, no. You have to listen. Because sometimes they will intentionally say the wrong thing. And they give you, and that's because they want to check your active listening. And okay. also you can correct any misconception. Okay. Mm -hmm. So patients may say something like, oh, maybe EpiPen. Oh, you told me that the blue should be to the tie and the orange should be to the sky. And you're going to be like, okay, well, that, that you've said a lot of things. However, I just want to correct again that with the pen, the blue, the cap, faces the sky and then the orange is actually the part that connects to the tie okay so you have to listen you have to listen it's important that you listen okay so you ask the patient to summarize you listen to them and most likely one or two times they would say something you know slightly off okay and something that is very that's quite obvious however if you're panicking too much if you're just all up in yourself you're just thinking about yourself you might miss it, okay? So make sure you listen. And then at the end, tell your patient, you will give them reading material. So you can say something like, you can end on a note of, you know, I've said a lot today about spatial devices. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give you a reading material where you can read more about it, okay? And in the event you have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out. And you ask them, is that fine? Would you like some reading material on spatial devices? Okay, you can even now because face a device is something that is practical, you can even say, Oh, I would check as well and see if we have videos or pictures that can also demonstrate what I've just said to you. Okay, so you definitely want to have all of those. Okay, so at the end, you would summarize again, you will clear any misunderstanding and then you will provide your patient with leaflet. Okay, and you can also be extra and say, All of these that we've discussed, I would document in your notes. Yeah. So just have it as a part of you that, okay, all this that we've discussed, it will also be documented in the notes, okay? So make sure you select, just let it be a part of you, you know, and this is not a waste at all. For those of you that will be writing PLOP to later on, this is something that you will be glad that you, you have a good foundation of already, okay? So... Um, you can also add that, okay? Everything we've said, I will document in my notes and I'll also um, let my seniors know about it, okay? Rise. So don't forget your S-P-I-K-S, okay? Spikes. S-P-I-K-S. Ask the patient to summarize the key points of the consultation. Again, it's really an opportunity to assess for misconception and to correct it. So make sure you are present mentally because you are present in the room physically. Well, make sure you are present, okay? Again, check. And at the end, after you've said everything, it doesn't hurt to say, do you have any other questions or concerns you'd like me to help you with? Most times they would say no. And then in that case, I mean, fine, you just smile at the patient and you wait until they say, move on to the next station, okay? Um, but always ask. Okay, don't assume that all the questions they ask after you've said everything, that's it. It's okay. Again, like think of it as you know somebody says something to me think of it as is an audition okay so you guys are going to be like 200 and something and you need to try to be the best of the best okay so that's not the day to be basic that's not the day to <laughs> i don't know how to I, I hope i'm communicating my my passion like it's not the time to be basic okay um so just try to be extra like, do you have any other questions or concerns? And smile, smile. Of course, if it's breaking bad news, obviously, you don't smile. But if you're counseling about surgery, there's no need to be sad. Like, you don't need to be, like, extra least. Like, you obviously don't need to be too excited. But just smile, you know. Oh, I'm really happy to. Do you have any other questions or concerns? And trust me, like, 
there is a way you smile there's a way you exit confidence yes yeah, so for the asthma i just put the information you need to talk about so you need to talk about so in your knowledge you need to talk about how a spacer device works and what is the advantage of a spacer device over a regular inhaler so the, these are things you need to know all these things are in dr sharishka book okay or geeky medics they are there. They are in Dr. Sharishka book. They are in Geeky Medics. Um, Geeky Medics, somebody's asking me. For me, I just bought the one-year subscription for Geeky Medics. I think it was like 20 US dollars. Um, that is it. And it has like over 700 cases. And to be honest, those cases are things you would see in NCA or PLAP2. It's just that for PLAP2, um, there is more material for PLAP2. You know, the issue is that with NCA, there is not a lot of material. I think the AI also comes with the $20. Yeah, because I've not tried it, though. Maybe I will try it and, and um, let you know for sure. Okay. Um, somebody said, what's the best way to use Geeky Medics? For me, what I did was that I subscribed and then my study partner as well subscribed. So we just go over. So we just give each other cases, you know, um, randomly. So... But we always knew what we wanted to do. We, we planned ahead. So maybe on Monday, okay, we need to do respiratory cases. On Tuesday, we need to do counseling cases. On Wednesday, oh, we want to do chest x-rays, ABG, and maybe two emergency case. So we actually had a plan. So sometimes we will tell each other ahead, okay, what are we doing today? Um, then closer to the exam, I literally had a list of stations that I felt like I've not done. And I just, so I gave out the list and said, okay, from this list, just give me any one case okay um but somebody said that there is an ai patient that you can interact with and to be honest i intend to try it i just haven't gotten the chance so but maybe i will try it and I'll let you guys know next week how how it works is dr sharish come more than enough i think he was for me it was enough however combine it with oski with max kim because that also has cases. The thing with Dr. Sharishka is that he just lists the cases. It doesn't have like um, the role play information. If I remember well, there is not like a lot of role play information, but it just, it, it guides you, it tells you, you know, these are the things you're likely to see. But the Geeky Medics and the OSCE with Max came as the role play, which is quite helpful. So that's it. Then demonstrating the use of a spacer. Yes, then how to care for a spacer device. So these are things that you have to read and these are possible questions the patient will ask you. Okay, so doctor, how does a spacer device work? And why should I use a spacer over uh, maybe using um, regular inhaler? You need to explain that. The reason is that First, with the regular inhaler, some of the medication may stick in the mouth and cause change in the taste. But with a spacer, it can be directed straight into the airway, okay? And making sure that the medication is um, um, de delivered evenly, okay? Then you demonstrate how to use a spacer, okay? So first, you need to sit upright. You need to take a deep breath in and exhale, okay? After which... You would put the spacer around your mouth and nose forming a tight seal. Okay. Then your inhaler, you would attach. So, be, sorry, before you put it around your mouth and form a tight seal, you would check your inhaler, make sure your inhaler is not expired, prime it to see that the medication is still there. Okay. And um, yeah, and then shake it. So, shake it, prime it, remove the cap. Then remove the mouthpiece now and attach it to the spacer. So, your inhaler has a mouthpiece, attach it to the spacer. Then form a tight seal around your mouth. Okay. Then after which you would press and you would take a deep breath and hold for at least maybe 10 seconds. Okay. Then you let the patient know if there is no improvement, you can wait for 30 seconds and do this again. All right. So that's it essentially. But I would suggest that you do read it and if possible, write it out like step by step. Trust me. Like if you put in the effort, if you put in the work, you will get the results. You will get the results. Okay. The assumption is that a lot of us feel like, oh, I think I know how to do it. Okay. Then you say it once and you figure you remember. For me, I write. Like I write. I write a lot. Like I have a note. During my NCA, I had a note. Like my note was filled. Like I always wrote down almost everything because that's how I learn more by writing. 
Okay. Then your patient might ask you, doctor, how do I care for spacer device? So, you know, there are things that the examiner is looking out for. First is wash it with under running tap with detergent. Okay. So with a dishwashing liquid. Now, another thing your examiner is looking out for is, or even the simulator may ask you, okay, so doctor, how do I dry it? Can I use a tissue? You know, that's a trap. Can I use a, um, a paper towel? You know, that's a trap. You tell them, no, you need to air dry it. Okay. You need to air dry it. However, you don't even need to let them prompt you. Just talk. So doctor, how do I care for the space of device? So first, um, you wash it with clean water and soap. You can wash it, you know, once a week or once a month, depending on how it's convenient for you. After which, it's important that you air dry it. Please do not wipe with paper towels or napkins as this can leave, um, leave smudge on it. And what happens is that the medication will stick to it. Okay. So you need to explain. You don't need to let them prompt you. Okay. You need to explain. But again, your chunk can check. Okay. So after you say those few sentences, is that clear? Are you okay? But another option some people do is, okay, you need to wash it under soap and water. Then they wait for the simulator to say, okay, doctor, how do I dry it? Personally, I feel like it's good to be proactive. Just, you know, take charge of your consultation. So these are the things that, these are some of the key things that you might get in the spacer device. Okay. Um, so try to, something, Born some information you, you would need to write down, okay? So some information you need to write down. So again, out, if you're familiar with how to use a spacer device, by all means, leave it alone, okay? Um, and I think in one of those books, I can't remember, the patient that needed a spacer also had arthritis. So you can tell him how, how it's an advantage, okay? Right, in the sense that there is less pressure on the wrist. So you, you give the advantage again and listen to the patient in front of you, think about their concerns, think about their issues and use it in your management. Okay. So that's it. Um, so that's an example of maybe explain a spacer, explain how to use an EpiPen. Okay. So that could be one scenario. Another scenario would be a patient with diabetes maybe break the news to this patient that this patient has been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Okay? So think of it yourself. Imagine if you have diabetes, what are the things you expect your doctors to tell you about? You expect your doctor to define it for you, to tell you why you have diabetes, how you can manage your diabetes. You want the doctor to tell you, um, what are complications of diabetes? What to do every day now that you're diabetic? What are important things to watch out for? Always put yourself in your patient's shoes, okay? Always put yourself in your patient's shoes. Sorry, there's um, <laughs> um for diabetic patients, you might not really smile that much, but maybe when you're talking, yeah, you you, you don't may, maybe next, but again, it's not like it's not like it's sad. Um but at the same time, yeah, maybe not too much smiling here. <laughs> yeah, so ask the patient. Um, I can see from my notes that you've been here before. Has anybody told you about what's going on? Now, these ones can be tricky how to enter. If the prompt says explain to the patient he has diabetes, maybe don't go inside and say, I can see from my notes that you just diagnosed with diabetes. You can say that, okay, I can see from my note that you came here a few days ago. And we've done some tests for you. Has anybody discussed um, your di um, the diagnosis? Has anybody discussed the case with you? Okay. So you may not just go in and say you have diabetes. I mean, it's a lifelong condition. Like put yourself in somebody's shoes. Okay. Be a person. Put yourself in your patient's shoes. You can't just go in and, you know, oh, you have diabetes. Okay. Of course, you ask them what symptoms did they experience? What was done for them? Were there any tests that were done? Okay. Then you go to Maftosa. You know, this is important. You know, for sure, your diet history is important. Physical activity is important. Drinking and smoking, like these are non-negotiable. Okay. Psychosocial, very, very important. Okay. Again, in UK, you are not just managing the disease. You are managing the person. Okay. You don't manage the disease. You manage the person. So psychosocial is very, very, very important, okay? And this is something that even in PLAB2 will stay with you. Psychosocial, you cannot miss it. Yes, for some conditions, maybe 
But to be honest, for me, just ask psychosocial. Like the earlier you get used to asking psychosocial everywhere, you will not miss it where it's relevant. Okay. So for this, your task will be you will explain diabetes, you will explain the causes of diabetes, the complications. So you, but don't just go in like, oh, um, that you can ask the patient, do you know what are some of the complications of this condition? So make it a conversation. Okay. It's a two way street. So you provide the patient opportunity to talk. Okay. So do you know what diabetes is? The patient says no, or maybe I know a little. Then whatever the patient says, commend them. Oh, that's really good. Then you add to that. Um, there are certain patients might ask you, doctor, what causes diabetes? Of course, you can explain that at this time, there are so many factors that can contribute to it. Uh, maybe in your family, you did tell me that, you know, your dad had diabetes that could have contributed to that, you know, so you can address that. Then complications, don't just jump to complication. Ask them, are you aware of complications of diabetes? Patient might say yes and mention one or two. Again, in addition to what they mentioned, add to it. Okay. So yes, diabetes is actually a lifelong condition. And um, it's a condition that then you tell them, well, first of obviously treatments before complication. Okay. So don't mind you. So treatment is more natural to come in. So after you explain the cause, you tell them how you manage it. So we're going to place you on insulin and you explain how to take the insulin and you explain the side effects. Every time you give your patient a medication, you have to give them side effects. It's really important, okay? So it's not enough to give them insulin, but you have to explain how to take it and side effects that they might experience. Why? So that if they have it, they can come back to you. They can seek help, okay? Then you go to complications, okay? So are you aware of some of the complications of diabetes? Say no, all right? So it could affect the eyes. It could affect the kidneys. And don't just list complication without solution. Like, don't just say it affects the eye. You can say it does affect the eye. And so we, we, um, we recommend a regular yearly checkup with the eye doctor. It can also affect your foot. So I would advise that you wear um, well-fitted shoes and you check your legs every day so again you're not just like reading stuff. you're providing the solutions and this is how you become patient-centered this is what makes you different from every other candidate because anybody knows again we are all doctors okay so all of us and we all did plab one so we are studying for it at some point okay so all of us know that diabetes causes retinal part, um, um, cardiac problems. It causes kidney problems. It causes food doctor. But what makes you stand out is being patient-centered. Think about it. If a doctor is just listing, oh, it can cause eye problem, heart problem, kidney problem, food problem, wouldn't you be nervous? But you come in there, oh, you know, we, rec we, we um, recommend regular eye checkup. It can affect your food. So I would advise that you check your food every day. And you also have regular appointments with the food doctor. In addition to the art, I would, I would recommend that you do your regular checks up with the GP. And if you notice at any point you're having any chest pain or trouble breathing, please do let your GP know. Please do let us know. So you're not just listing. And that's, that's what makes it different. That's the difference. So it's not so you might wonder, okay, what's so unique about all these stations? Because these stations assess your level of communication. Okay. So they're assessing your communication. Yes. Then you, again, you emphasize the import, importance of monitoring. So it's really important that you do your regular checkup as it helps us to know if your diabetes is well controlled and if we'll need to adjust your medications. Okay. So you explore that. Yes. In some cases, if patient is not forthcoming, you might need to, you know, scare them. <laughs> but for the most part, I think just being nice, just being, you know, friendly. Um, and just caring about them is enough, unless it's a difficult station. So, you know, in exam, you might get an angry patient. You might get a patient that is angry. You might get a patient that you need to negotiate with. Okay. Um, but these are all of these and they all fall under counseling. Um, just to, since I just talked about angry patient, the tip with angry patients is that when they're angry, obviously, and that should make sense to you, you cannot be angry. Okay. <laughs> if your patient is, 
angry, like that's not the time for you to be upset. Okay. So acknowledge their anger. Okay. Mr. Jones, I can see that you're quite upset about this. And you can even say something like that. To be honest, anybody in your shoes will feel the same way. Acknowledge it. Okay. If your patient is standing, stand. Don't like if your patient is sitting down, sit. But if your patient is standing, don't just robotically enter the room and go and take a seat. Like, don't do that. Okay. So try to be on the same eye level as your patient. But just try to pacify your patient. If at the end you've maybe able to see that he's calm, then you can ask him, Mr. Jones, is it okay if we take a seat and we can talk more about, you know, how to address your concerns or how I can be of help to you today. And again, you apologize. Okay. For angry stations, the goal is just apologize. Just keep like, just apologize. Okay. But not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like obviously add things, address and move, move forward. Okay. Please learn, you know, keep your voice calm with angry patients. Please don't meet their tone. Okay. If you meet their tone, you will definitely fill the station. Okay. So don't show that you're impatient. Don't show that you're annoyed. Yes, e e exam anxiety can get to you because in your mind, you just need to finish. You just need to ask questions. Like, why is this man acting up? Just go with the flow, okay? So just go with the flow. All right, so that's that for diabetes. Again, read, read these things on Dr. Sharishka book and practice these cases. Practice them, okay? So practice them. Yes, another thing you might get is patient with learning disability, okay? You might get a patient with learning disability. So it would be a shame for you to enter the station and just talking about, oh, I can see you've been diagnosed with a blood clot and you've been placed on warfarin. Do you know what, um, do you know what condition you have? Do you know what the medication does? No. The first thing is address the learning disability, Okay. So address the learning disability. Oh, Mr. Jones, I can see from my notes that you do experience some difficulty when it comes to, you know, maybe learning or you have learning disability. Can you tell me what type you have? Because you know that there are different types of learning disability. And based on that, you prefer solutions. For learning disability, there is really nothing you're doing except don't use medical language. Like this is one of those stations where you cannot say the word DVT. Like don't try it. Blood clots. Okay. You've been placed on blood thinners to help dissolve the blood clots. Although this is really how you should communicate with any patient anyway. And also you can pace yourself just a little. Don't be too slow. Just, just pace yourself slightly. Okay. Compared to maybe your other patient that doesn't have learning disability okay so you might get that for your nca I, and that's the kind of learning disability so if it's issue remembering tell them you'll write it down for them if it's that they cannot even read then you know then talk it to them and tell them oh you know what i would repeat myself as well and let them know if at any point please you're not getting me please do not hesitate i'm more than happy to go back I'm more than happy to go over this with you, okay? Sometimes solutions might be set in reminder. So patient might say, I have issues remembering, you know? I don't usually, like when somebody tells me something, I forget easily. So then you can write it down. You can set reminders. You recap again when you say something. For patient with disability, I think here yeah, it's okay to even tell them, can you tell me what you understand? Are you, or do you understand what I just said to you now? Can you tell me, okay, now I've told you how to take the warfarin. You're supposed to take it in the evening. Um, you're supposed to take it once a day. Can you please tell me how to take it? Why? Because you want to assess if you've communicated clearly. So this might not be those that it's, you can just, okay, do you understand that you move on? However, maybe they repeat to me, you, you may not do it all through so that you will not run out of time, but you can do it at key points. So for example, when you tell them how to take warfarin, when you tell them the side effects, Okay. But maybe when you're explaining, explaining INR, you don't need to do that, okay? So just that setting key point, you just tell them to, you know, tell you what they've said. Again, patient-centered, patient-centered, okay? So warfarin, what is warfarin? How does it work? So warfarin, do you know why we've placed you on this medication? You will say, I don't know. Then you explain, okay, 
So you add um, a pain in your leg and we actually found that, that there was a blood clot in your leg. And because of that, we're giving you medications to help prevent the cloth or to dissolve or to ensure that your body doesn't make blood clots again. Okay. How should I take it? You can say, okay, that's a very, and when the, when the patient asks you things like that, you can say, wow, that's a very good question. You know, that's a really good question. I like the fact that you asked, I, oh, I said that to one of my patients and the guy really smart. I'm like, that's a very important question. I'm like, you know what? I'm really glad you mentioned that. Okay. <laughs> and the guy was just smiling. So you can say things like that. Oh, that's a very brilliant question. Oh, that's a really important question. I'm glad that you brought that up because that's really important to know. You know, so you just, you know, just show things here and then. So how should you take it? You explain, take it in the evening or bedtime or whatever, um, once a day. If I miss a do those doctor, what should happen? You explain to them. Advice. When they are warfarin, so this one is warfarin specific, they need to let healthcare professionals know because, you know, warfarin has um, interactions with some other medications, right? So they need to know that, let healthcare workers know that. They're on. So by that, either their alert card, their bracelet, okay? And they usually have a book as well. And then you need to let them know that you will monitor the warfarin, okay? Um, how do you monitor it, INR? You explain it. When is it done? How often is it done? What is the usefulness? What range are we interested in? Then what side effects should a patient watch out for? Again, if you talk about a medication and you don't talk about side effects, I do know that some, some exams will not forgive you so much. Okay? So much. Because when you give patient medication, you really have to talk about side effects. Okay? And what are the side effects? Bleeding. And they could bleed inside the brain. So let the patient know. If you have unusual headaches, maybe you feel like this is the worst headache of your life, or you just have this headache that feels different, please call 999. If you are bleeding from any part of your body, okay, try to stop the bleeding first. If after 10 minutes you cannot stop it, please dial 999 or go to the nearest emergency. Again, you don't highlight problems. You must also give solutions. Hmm, is there a BNF? For NCA, to be honest, I didn't take notes. I did not take notes if there was BNF. But in prescription, for sure, there is BNF. But I don't know if it's in every room. Yes, so what should they do? Should they experience any side effects? Then you can also, they may also be concerned about the side effect. Let them know that, okay, they're antidotes, you know, in the event that they do have side effects. Okay, so there are things that we can do. So again, let them know. Please call 999. Please go to the nearest emergency, okay? And say all these things with a sense of urgency, okay? Then let them know as well their diet. So you know there are certain foods that interact with vitamin K, okay? So like spinach, um, some broccoli, all those vegetables. So again, these are possible stations. So again, I've mentioned possible things, how to use an inhaler, how to use a spacer device, how to use an EpiPen, how to use peak expiratory flow rate, um, counsel patient on diabetes, epilepsy, um, patients on warfarin, statins, osteoporosis. Again, these are the possibilities are endless. Okay. But I believe that if you subscribe to Geeky Medics and you do their OSCE, with the OSCE with Max Skin, I feel like almost everything that you need is somewhere in those two. All right. So, yes. So another counseling station, you might get is surgery. Okay. So your patient is coming for surgery pre or post-op. They, they want to know about the procedure. So you ask them again, you introduce yourself, you explain what you're yet to do. Ask them, what do they know about the procedure? What do they know about the surgery? Again, it helps you to be patient centered. What exactly would they like to know? Okay. Then your knowledge. So now you start talking. So the initial like two minutes gets the patients, let your patient speak, give your patient room. And after each information, um, ask the patient, is that clear? Is that okay? Okay. So the patient's question might be, doctor, what type of surgery are you going to do? So you know that we can either do an open surgery, okay? Or we could do a keyhole surgery. Please don't say laparoscopy, okay? So a keyhole surgery. 
and you need to explain what a keel surgery is. So with a keel surgery, the surgeon or the specialist is going to make three small incisions on your belly. Then they're going to insert a tube that has a camera inside so that they can visualize. Then gas will also be introduced to give more space. Okay. Then you let, let them know that a keel surgery can sometimes be converted to an open surgery if there are complications. Okay. So if the surgeon is unable to, maybe they want to remove the appendix and let them know that, okay, then finally they remove the appendix. Okay. So the surgeon will make a cord, remove it. However, if they have problem visualizing the appendix or maybe there is more complication, then in that case, we might need to convert to an open surgery. So even if the case says describe with this patient laparoscopic appendectomy, it's not enough to just talk about it without talking about the fact that it could potentially become an open surgery. Okay. So you have to let the patient know that. Sorry. I have the cold. So the patient may want to know what kind of surgery. Then if it's an open surgery as well, you explain. Then patient may want to know things like, Doctor, how long will the surgery last? And one thing, because I write, eventually I figured it out. Because I was trying to read in um, colonoscopy, um, bronchoscopy, endoscopy, cholecystectomy, appendectomy. And I'm like, how am I supposed to remember? And one day I just drew a table and I wrote out all the surgery. And then I wrote the timing and I realized almost everything is the same. So 30 to 45 minutes for the most part. And I realized, oh, okay. So it's just one common answer for the most part. But a few surgeries are different. So then I paid attention to those ones that are different. Okay. So you can do that. For example, endoscopy will be shorter. Okay. Maybe 15 to 30 minutes. But again, you would notice that almost all your answers are going to be the same. You just have to know one or two key things about each of them. So if it's a keel surgery, how long will I stay in the hospital for? Within a day or two, after which you can go home. Of course, if it's like endoscopy, colonoscopy, you know, you're going on that same day, okay? Um, so you explain that. Doctor, are there complications for the surgery? For complications, always think of, there are three things we always talk about. Complication, infection, for which if it arises, we will give you antibiotics. Bleeding, okay? So there'll be options if need be, um, but again, assure them that the surgeons are quite skilled. Okay. So complications and um, injury to nearby structure. If you say this three for almost anything, you are not wrong. Okay. So that's about that some of the complications. Well, some of the complications could be infection, bleeding, injury, or even pain at the site. So have this four at the back of your mind. You're not wrong for any procedure. But again, you might want to be more specific. For colonoscopy, there might be bloating. There might be perforation. Okay. However, I just put this here, like just in case you are stuck, like, you know, exam tension, in case you ever get anxious and you don't know what to say, just start with this. And as you say this, the others will flow. Okay. So infection, bleeding, injury to nearby structure, pain. As you say this, the others will flow. Okay, so don't get stuck. So I put it out there. However, again, still do your homework, research on each of these um, different types of procedures, okay, and surgery, and know there if there is any specific complication to any of them. Okay. Okay. Then the patient may say, "Doctor, will I be put to sleep?" So you know, in some of them, the patient would just be sedated, okay, and in some, patient will be put to sleep. So please, again, research, okay. Do your research. Know which is which. Doctor, will I experience any pain? Oh, yes, you might. However, okay. And don't start with yes or no. Some of, sometimes those questions are not really yes or no, okay? Doctor, will I be in pain? Can say again. And that's why you use things like, well, that's a very good question you're asking. Um, yeah, um, sometimes our patients experience pain, but we do provide pain medication after the surgery, okay? Doctor, the complications, you already explained that. Doctor, when can I drive? So for this, you would say that there, there are a couple of things that um, depends, okay? For the most part, a lot of patients are able to drive within two to four weeks, after which there is no pain, okay? 
and they can do an emergency break without pain. And you can let the patient know that for emergency breaks, you don't need to um, you don't need to start the car. You can just practice. Like you don't need to drive. You can just keep practicing while your car is parked. How to do an emergency break. So they can drive once they don't have pain. Okay. And they can do an emergency break without pain. Okay. And usually this is about two to four weeks. But again, let them know that everybody is different. Okay. Yes, you can smell definitely. Yeah. Then patient may ask you, when can I go back to work? Again, you would um, tell them, on average, most people are able to go back to work in about. So we expect that. You may not even say most people can say you expect to go back to work in two to four weeks. Okay. However, I would advise that you do take it easy. Okay. So when you go to work, please don't do any heavy lifting. Even at home, make sure you don't lift um, anything heavy. Take it easy. Um, and this is where you have to ask, do you have anybody at home to assist you? Is there anybody after the surgery that can look after you? You know, surely for the first maybe 48 hours or for the first one week, is there anybody at home that could be of assistance to you? Doctor, when can I have sex? Again, um, you can have sex on average, again, depending on the surgery, two to four weeks. Okay. However, for MI, it's more specific. It's like four to six weeks. Okay. So it's like four to six weeks. So, and this is why I learned the different cases, okay? The Dr. Shereshka book, for me, it was life-saving. And I guess I'll keep talking about it. I mean, I don't even know her. Like, she doesn't pay me to advertise her, but I'm just saying what I used, okay? And it was enough. Unless, and hopefully not, they decide to change the entire structure of the exam. When can I drive? Yeah, so these are some of the common questions, Okay. Doctor, will I be put to sleep? How long will it last? And if you check Dr. Sharishka book, all these book, all these questions are there. If you check Geeky Medics, all these questions are there. Oski with Max King, these are the questions. Those of you doing PLAB 2, these are the questions. These are your patient's common concerns. Okay? So these are the common concerns. All right, so that's it. So again, I've gone over all the possible. Well, not over, but obviously, there are lots. Um, if somebody doesn't, yeah, that's a very important question. If somebody doesn't have um, someone to assist, then in that case, you can say that we would arrange carers for you. Okay, so you can just say that. Oh, um, then we could, or you could ask if they have any relatives nearby or any friends that could come check on them. If they still say no, then just let them know that you can arrange carers for them. All right, so for counseling, again, I'm just listing it here, although everything is in Dr. Sharish Kabul, EpiPen, inhaler, insulin, spacer device, gastroscopy, colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, appendectomy, cholecystectomy, gastrectomy, coronary artery bypass, knee replacement. Yes, you might also be asked to counsel a patient about smoking, alcohol, maybe drug use, weight loss, okay? So... You see that the bigger part is your knowledge, okay? The main part for you really is the knowledge, okay? You know, for colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, the procedure is the same. There is a thin flexible tube with a camera. So if it's gastroscopy, it's will be passed into the stomach and then we will visualize parts of your stomach. If we notice anything abnormal, we may need to take a tissue sample. Don't use the word biopsy, okay? So we need to take a tissue sample and send it to the lab to be viewed under a microscope. If we do take a tissue sample, is that clear? You pause, okay? Is that clear? Yes. If we do take a tissue sample, we might need to send, we'll need to send it to the lab and it might take some time for the um, results to come out. Is that okay? If the patient asks, how long will it take? On average, it's about two weeks, after which we'll invite you to discuss the test results. Are you following me? Do you understand? Do you see how I chunked and checked? Initially, you said I was about to just be blabbing and blabbing and blabbing. Okay, so <laughs> your chunk and check. Colonoscopy is the same. And when you're explaining this procedure, you have to explain what happens before the procedure, during the procedure, and after the procedure. And even surgery, anything. Before surgery, what does the patient need to do? You need to fast. Before surgery, you need to, be fa you need to fast. You'll be seen by the anesthetic, the doctor, that helps with the sedation or putting you to sleep. Okay, so before the surgery, you will need to fast. Okay, you explain maybe six hours, 12 hours, whatever the case is. You know, if it's colonoscopy, gastro, um, colonoscopy, they will need to also take um, laxatives. Okay, 
And if they're taking laxatives, they need to be at home where there is a bathroom. Okay. Then they will be seen by the anesthetic, anesthetic doctor. Sorry, not anesthesia. <laughs> Anesthesiologist. I hope I spelled it well. Anyways, then the surgery itself. So before you need to fast, if they take medication, whatever the medication is, if they need to stop it a few days before, address that. Okay. They'll be seen by the anesthetic. Bloods will also be taken from them for labs. So bloods like group and group and save and routine tests. Okay. Then after then during, so explain. You'll be taken to surgery, maybe you'll be put to sleep, or you, the area will be numbed. Okay. Whatever it is. So if it's endoscopy, um, all right, thank you. So if it's endoscopy. We, we might need to spray the back of your tongue, okay? So again, talk about the anesthetic, whatever way it happens, okay? The anesthesia, okay? Then explain what will happen during the surgery. So the, the cuts, okay? Explain the duration, okay? Then um, what else do you do during? Um, yeah. Then afterwards, you'll be taken to recovery, where you'll be monitored, okay? So you'll be sent to a recovery room where you'll be monitored, okay? Now, if it's colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, you know that after which you would need to, you will go home, then this is where you have to provide. So you would need to go home. So you'll be sent home once everything is fine. You will be sent home. However, please, it's important that you do arrange transport as you cannot drive, okay? So you'll be sent home arrange transport or if it's appendectomy cholecystectomy you might need to stay with us for about a day or two after which you'll be sent home okay is there somebody at home that can help you in the next 48 hours you need to ask that okay so somebody to help you somebody to assist okay then please don't sign any documents why? Because for actually for colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, they are still under influence of the anest um, anesthesia. Okay, so don't sign any document. No heavy lifting and no taking care of minors. Okay, so don't be solely responsible for minors. So these are your after. Okay, and that way you'll be more organized before, during, after. You do that for surgery. You do that for procedure. You can never go wrong. Before the procedure, what happens? During the procedure, what happens? After the procedure, what happens? If it's hip replacement, after what happens? You'll be seen by physio. You'll be seen by occupational therapy. They would ask, physio would help you with exercises, how to bend properly, how to work. Occupational therapy will assess your own. If it's coronary artery bypass, afterwards, once we check, you'll be seen by the specialists. There might be lifestyle changes you need to make. So you're not wrong in any way when you do before, during, after for procedures and surgeries, okay? So think of it that way. And that way you will have all your relevant, important information. Okay? All right.